So chapter one, section two, we're going to look at the phases of matter as well as the classification of matter. Now, matter. We know matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. We have three common states or phases of matter. We use these terms interchangeably. We know that a solid is rigid and it possesses a definite shape. So any solid has a definite shape and volume. A liquid flows and it takes the shape of its container. So it is going to have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. And a gas has neither a definite shape or volume. It takes the shape and the volume of its container. If we're going to go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, we have to add heat. When we add heat, we break the little forces that hold these together and allow it to break up from solid liquid to a gas. If we want to go from a gas to a liquid to solid, we're going to remove heat. We do have a fourth state of matter, and that is a plasma. And a plasma is a gaseous state of matter that contains a lot of electrically charged particles. In fact, the plasma may be the most common state of matter, matter in the universe. For example, stars are made out of um, plasma, but we don't see a lot of them down here, so we're just going to kind of ignore it. So properties of matter. We need to make sure we totally understand the difference between mass and weight. Weight is the pull of gravity on an object or on a mass. And a mass is just the measure of the amount of matter in an object. So if you have you know, some sort of a piece of matter, the mass of it, it truly is the sum of the protons and the neutrons and the electrons. And the total matter of that is going to be the mass of something. Note, an object's mass is consistent, but the weight can change as gravity is going to change. We have a couple of important laws here. One here is the law of conservation of matter. It says that if we go from one reaction or one type of matter into another, the total quantity of it never changes. So if we took, for example, hydrogen and we reacted it with oxygen and we made some water, looking at, again, our symbolic state here, when we do a reaction, the total mass, the total number of protons, neutrons, electrons, or total number of atoms is going to stay the same on starting to the ending point in any chemical reaction. This is true for chemical and physical changes. Chemicals when we make something new, physicals when we change state. So let's take a look at matter and break it down to its components that are relevant to chemistry. And we're not going to do subatomic until the next chapter. So we're going to start out with an element. An element or the elements are what we see on the periodic table. They are pure substances that cannot be broken down into simpler pieces by chemical changes. A chemical change is a change in the lab. So we can't go to any normal chemistry lab and take an element and break it down into smaller pieces. So we could talk about helium, or we could talk about oxygen, and these are going to be our elements. Now, it doesn't have to be just one of them to be an element. Our periodic table looks like this. We're going to talk a lot about why it's shaped like this and what these values mean as we continue to go on in the next chapters. So the smallest part of an element that has the properties of that element is called an atom. So if we have, for example, one atom of helium or one atom of carbon, it is going to have properties of that stuff. If we break it into smaller pieces, then we're going to have subatomic particles, which are all identical. This um, idea of an atom was uh, first proposed in the 5th century BCE by Democritus, and it was supported by uh, John Dalton in England with a lot of good experiments um, in the 19th century. So our atoms, our atoms are going to come together and make molecules. So if we have two or more of our atoms held together by chemical bonds, we are going to make a molecule. Now, in general, molecules are considered to be electrically neutral. 
but there's a little discussion on whether or not that's the best definition. Very few elements exist as individual atoms. They are mostly our noble gases and they're things like helium and neon, and these are by themselves as an individual atom. Most elements uh, exist as molecules where two or more of them are bond together. So for example, we know O2 or Cl2, um, even sulfur, which is S8, you could make C60, which is elemental carbon. It doesn't have to be, by the way, an element. It doesn't have to be something by itself. Otherwise, we would have a very short list. An element is just the same stuff in, or atoms of the same stuff in some ratio. So these are molecules of elements. Now, molecules do not have to be the same stuff, such that we have more than one atom of the same stuff. It could be more than one atom of different elements. So carbon dioxide or glucose are all molecules. Molecules here are, exist as a unit, which is very important. So H2O, CO2, glucose, et cetera, are two or more atoms of different elements, chemically bonded, and these are gonna be our molecules. All right, so let's look at pure substances. Pure substances have constant composition, and they are into, broken into two different types. Either our elements, which we understand. Elements, again, cannot be broken down into smaller pieces by chemical changes or in the lab. They can be single atoms or represented as single atoms, or they can be represented by multiple atoms and be molecules. But we can also have compounds. Now, a compound is a um, fixed ratio of two or more elements chemically bonded, our compounds can be broken down into simpler pieces by chemical changes. So for example, if we have water, we can take water and we can break it into hydrogen and oxygen. And because we can break our water into hydrogen and oxygen and break it down into smaller pieces, it is not a element, it is a compound. Compounds are also going to be made up of two or more different elements. So a compound could be H2O or silver chloride or NaCl. If it's got two or more different elements chemically bonded, that can be broken down by chemical changes, meaning in the lab, then we have a compound. By the way, it's a fixed ratio. So what if we take and we have oxygen, and we put oxygen with some nitrogen, maybe a little bit of carbon dioxide, by the way, that's air. Now the amount of oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide can vary. And if we take and we have two or more types of matter that can be in varying proportions, we have a mixture. Now mixtures can be separated by physical changes. Physical changes are changes such that you do an experiment, but you end up with the same material. So if I had water as a liquid and I turned it into water as a gas, it's still water, it's just changed phase or changed state, and that is going to be a physical change. A mixture can always be separated by physical chains and they always are made up by two or more types of matter, and the key being in varying amounts. If it's a fixed proportion, it's going to be a compound, it's a variable amount, it's going to be a mixture. We have two types of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homogeneous is a mixture that appears visually, i.e. as we look at it, to be the same throughout. When we look in chemistry and we talk about homogeneous mixtures, we call them solutions. So if we had just a container and in this container we had salt water and we had our NaCl dissolved in our H2O, we can't see the separate sodium and chloride ions, and therefore this would be a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture or a solution of sodium chloride. A heterogeneous mixture has a composition that varies. That would be something like chicken noodle soup, all right? Not the same or smooth throughout. Examples of, mixture, of mixtures here, this would be a heterogeneous. And it would be heterogeneous because we can see the bubbles here, 
in the mixture of the oil and the water. Gatorade, on the other hand, we can't tell the sugar from the electrolytes, from the flavoring, and therefore it is going to be a homogeneous mixture. So a really good way to look at it. We're going to start with matter. Does it have a constant proportion? So constant proportion, if the answer is yes, we're going to have a pure substance. Can we simplify it chemically? Can we break it apart? The answer is no, it's going to be an element. If the answer is yes and we could break it apart, it is going to be a compound. Also, a compound is going to be two or more different elements. So what if instead it has a variable proportion? If we've got stuff like sugar in water and we can vary the amount of stuff in it, if it, we can, it is a mixture. If we can see the separation in it, if it's not uniform throughout, it's heterogeneous. If we cannot physically see the separation of the different components of the mixture, it is going to be homogeneous.